This is the fourth and final section of the group chapter. And here we're going to be looking at isomorphisms. So the first thing, what does this word isomorphism mean? Well, actually, it means the same type. And we're going to be looking at groups which are of the same type. So we're going to first of all consider two groups which um, are isomorphic to one another. First of all, by looking at their Cayley tables and these two groups, one will be a group that we'll call G and the star will represent its binary operation. And the second group would be H and this little dot circle thing represents its binary operation. So here are my two Cayley tables here. You can see group G has the elements uh, e, P, Q, R, and group H has the elements 3, 1, 4, 2. And what I'm interesting in, interested in is, is there a mapping or a function that basically matches up all the elements in this table with all the elements in this table? Can I work out which elements in the second table do the same thing as the first uh, table, Cayley table there, and we're going to try and do that first. So let's start by looking at, first of all, the identity. That's probably easy to uh, work out. So I can see that in the first table, the identity is E, and in the second table, the identity is 1, because that leaves the rows and the columns um, unchanged. So I could write down that there's a mapping that takes the identity in table one to the um, identity in table two. Now I could write this as there's a mapping or a function. So it's a function of E that means it equals one in the second group. So look at the notation, a function of this element becomes the element in the second group, okay? Right, what other elements can we try and match up? Right, let's look at P. What does P match up to in the second table? Now, P actually matches up to the element 2. So I could write there's a mapping function that takes P to 2. Q, well, that matches up with the element 3 in the second table. So I could write there's a function of Q equals 3. And R maps to 4. So there's a function of R that becomes 4. Now I've sort of done this by basically looking at the operations and seeing what the results are. So for example, let's look at um, this result here. Okay, so basically what that tells me that cell in a table represents the binary operation of P and Q, because you've got P here, Q there. So the binary operation of P and Q, which I write like this, is equal to R. Now there should be something that matches up in exactly the same way in the second table. Now P, I said maps to two and Q maps to three. So I'm looking for the binary operation of two and three. So that matches up. So that binary operation, let's find it in a table, two and three would be here in the table. Okay, so what that represents here, maybe let's do that in a red pen. So it doesn't like part of the table. So this actually represents the same type of calculation because we've said P goes to 2, Q goes to 3. Now that should equal R. Now we said R goes to 4 and it does. Yeah, that's just one example. You could pick any binary operation, any result in this table with this mapping and there may be other mappings that do the same thing. You can take a result here take an operation here, find the same equivalent operation in the second table, 
and they would match up. So actually, structurally, this is the same as the first table, even though it doesn't look the same and things are in a slightly different order. I mean, you've got the identity along the diagonal here. I suppose that's the same. You've got some symmetry across the table. OK, but you can see that actually trying to find an isomorphism, that's what this is, a mapping that takes you from one group to another using a Cayley table probably isn't the easiest and best way to do it because there may be other ways or other mappings that do the same thing and it's a bit of matching up and that can be difficult to do so we're going to be looking at another way of actually working out how we work out what elements in the first table match to what elements in the second table so the notation for this because these two um, tables these two groups are basically the same thing they have the same structure they've got the same number of elements i can take every element in the first group and map, map it to one element in the second group we say that g and h are isomorphic okay g and h are isomorphic and we've got some notation for that and it looks like an equal sign with a squiggly line above it so we can say g and we can write it like this is isomorphic to h that basically means the same thing so when you see that notation it's telling you right we have two isomorphic groups so if we were to sort of formalize this what have we done well uh, G is isomorphic to H since, right, what have we basically shown? Well, first of all, um, that all the elements in G can be mapped, well, they are actually mapped to all the elements in H. Secondly, this mapping is one to one. Mapping is one to one. So E doesn't map to one and two, it just maps to one element. Each element here just maps to exactly one element in the second group. And uh, lastly, the structure is preserved. The structure of this table, although like the columns are mixed up, if I'd written maybe one, two, uh, three, four, it would look exactly like this. Yeah, but the actual structure is preserved, even though it looks different. OK, so the second thing or the third thing, the structure of G is preserved in this mapping now let's have a, a little bit more of a closer look at this or these operations here that we said basically do the same thing if i perform the binary operation or a binary operation in p and q okay and then map it to the second group that is equal to taking a mapping of the first element f of p which we know is two so that's two combining it with a mapping of the second element f of p sorry f of q and we know or what we've just shown from what was highlighted in green before here that this is this statement is true so i'll just say that again that if we take um, p and q and do the binary operation on it and then whatever that result is well that's r isn't it so basically what i've got here is f of r which is four is the same as if i map p to two map q to three and do the binary operation of these mappings so 2.3 which i know is 4 so i've basically got 4 equals 4 
So here we've got operation and then map. Here we've got map and then do operation. And again, we can generalize this for like any two elements in our isomorphic groups. And that would look like this. So if we map the result of an operation between elements A and B, that equals the mapping of A combined with the mapping of B. OK, so this is for all elements in G with um, this binary operation star, uh, which is isomorphic to um, another group, let's call that H, with the little dot as the binary operation. So another way of thinking of this is that we do the operation first, operation first, in the case we've got here, star, and then we do the um, mapping second, mapping second, and that mapping was F. And that is the same as doing the mapping first. So you can see on the um, right hand side here, the mapping is done first. And, th and that mapping is still F, it's still the same, same thing. But then we do the operation second, operation second, and that operation is the, the dot thing. So what we're going to look at next are now the rules for isomorphic groups. OK, so these two groups will be G and H. Now, remember before we tried to find the mappings for those two groups by looking at their Cayley tables, the rules we have below are going to be more straightforward ways of actually finding the mappings between two groups. So the first rule is, is that, um, so let's call F is the mapping, F is the mapping. So first of all, the mapping of the identity in group G is equal to the identity in group H. And actually these uh, rules work backwards as well. So you could say, right, if you did the inverse of the mapping on the identity of H, that will take you to the identity in G. So these mappings are reversible. Second rule is that um, if we map the inverse in our, our first group, that will become the inverse of the mapping. Okay, so basically F of A here represents an element in the second group, let's call that group H. So we have the inverse in our first group that is equal to basically take mapping the element and finding the inverse of it. Again, these rule, this rule works the other way around as well. Also, um, elements which have the same order here. So um, if we have uh, an element in the first group that has a particular order, then actually it will map to an element of the same order. Now, this is really useful when we want to find uh, mappings from one uh, group to another or one Cayley table to another is to do with the order of the elements. So order of elements uh, remains the same. So for example, if I've got an element of order two in my uh, original group, let's say G, then it will be isomorphic to another element also of order two. So the order will be the same um, in both groups. We can summarize that by saying that our isomorphism, which we write like this, um, it preserves three things. 
So it preserves the identity. So the identity element will do uh, the same type of thing. It will act in the same way. It preserves uh, inverses. So um, the inverses will match up as well. And it preserves order, the order of the elements. The order of the original group and its isomorphic group will be the same. The order of all the elements remains the same. So the order of all the elements remains the same. Remains the same. So for example, if we had a group where all of the elements were self inverse, then in the isometric group, all of the elements will be self inverse as well. So they'd all remain order two. Or if you had an element um, that was order three, for example, um, the order of all of the elements remains the same. Moving on to subgroups as well. So we'll just write down subgroups. So again, with these isomorphic groups, the order of the subgroups remains the same. So the order of subgroups remains the same. The same. Subgroups are also isomorphic. So a subgroup of G, so we're just using G and H, is isomorphic to a subgroup of H. So not only are the groups isomorphic, their subgroups are isomorphic as well. And also, uh, if G is G is cyclic, then uh, H is cyclic. Okay, and that's for the group itself and the subgroups. So you can see the whole structure of the the original group is preserved to the set in the second group in terms of the identity inverse order uh, the order of the group the order of the subgroups um, subgroups are isometric um, if g is cyclic then the h is cyclic that's for groups and subgroups and because we have all of these similarities in structure if we want to find uh, or show that groups are isomorphic, it's easier to compare the order of the elements as they will be the same rather than comparing uh, Cayley ta tables. We'll just write that down. So um, it is easier to show two groups are isomorphic, isomorphic by comparing the order of the elements, order of elements, rather than comparing Cayley tables. So we can match up elements that have um, the same order, then that will be our mapping and that will be easier to do and sometimes there may be more than one mapping um, and I think in one of the examples we'll we'll see that there's actually more than one possible mapping but as long as we match up the order of the elements that will show um, uh, that they're isomorphic so lastly before we move on to some examples what we're going to look at is a table that shows all the possible groups up to order eight so this table here is going to help us when we want to find um, mappings of one group to another, because this will help us to actually identify what the order of different elements will be. OK, now this isn't in the formula book, so not in formula book. So we do need to remember it. Now, are there any ways that we can 
used to help us identify um, and remember what's going on in this table. Well, the first row of the table, uh, this is just a trivial group, okay, the only group of order one. So this trivial group only contains the identity. Identity only in that group of all the one all the other groups are going to be the non-trivial groups so all of these down here down to the bottom are the non-trivial groups are there any patterns well apart from uh, one which isn't a prime number let's have a have a look at the groups where the um, order is prime so order two order three, order five, order seven. Now, what do we notice about all of these groups? Well, there's only one type of group, one type of example for each group, and they're all the same, aren't they? It's all addition under modulo two, three, five, and seven. Okay, so all the primes are basically all the same. Can you see also as well that they're all um, cyclic order seven, five, three, and two. So they're all the same. Yeah. So if we've got a group that and a number of elements is a prime number, um, apart from the uh, trivial group, notice that they're all the same. There's only going to be one type of group, and the order of that group is going to be the same as um, the number of elements in that group. And they're all going to be addition under the modulus of that prime number two, three, five, or seven. The other groups which are not prime also have these groups included in them as well. These uh, groups which are addition under um, the modulus of that number. So uh, here we go, these ones here. But notice um as well that they're also cyclic groups so it seems every group has these cyclic groups whether it's prime or not but the groups of order four six and eight have these extra groups as well and these are probably the ones that we need to try and remember so uh, a group of order four has this group called the Klein four group which we represent by using k4 and that's a symmetry group of a rectangle. Okay, and what does what do we know about the elements in that group? Well, it's only one non-cyclic group of order four. Every element except the identity has order two. So it's non-cyclic, it's not cyclic, not cyclic like the other ones that we've done so far. And every element in that group except the identity has order two. So that's going to be useful if we know we've got a group of order four and we notice it's not cyclic and every group has order two, that's going to be useful in identifying it as the Klein four group. Right, let's move on to uh, a group of order six. Now here we have actually um, two groups which basically do the same thing. S3 is the set of all possible permutations of three elements like 1, 2, 3, 1, 3, 2, and so on. And D6 is the symmetry group of an equilateral triangle. So both of those groups are isometric to each other. The reason being none of them has an element of order 6. So if we find a group of six elements, and none of the elements has a group of order six, in other words, there is no generator to that group, then we know that it's this type, it's either S3 or D6 that it's isometric to. And then moving on to um, eight elements in a group, this is where we have um, a few more that we need to remember. So um, here we have the symmetry group of a square, which is represented by D8. And the information about the elements is here. No element of order eight. Exactly two of the elements, or only two of the elements exactly, have order four. 
then we have the multiplication here of z4 and z2 and again we can see that here are the rules no element of order 8 actually that's the same as the previous one isn't it d8 exactly four elements of order four so this is what separates these two groups out exactly four elements of order two here it's exactly four elements of order four whereas this is the same for both groups then we've got z2 times z2 times z2 and again let's have a look at the rules down here no element of order eight so that's the same as the uh, previous two that we looked at this is what's going to differentiate the groups is that every element except the identity has order two so that's the difference between uh, this and the previous two that's what's going to distinguish those groups and then lastly we have the quaternion group and with that no element has no element of order a again the same as the previous ones so that's not going to help us distinguish the group but it's to do with the actual um, order of particular elements and here we've got exactly six of the elements or have order four so that's what's going to distinguish each of these groups i put a little circle there because that will help us decide what type of order eight group it is and then we'll just highlight this here to finish it off so yeah you do need to uh, memorize that table but there are ways of simplifying it and really it's the groups of order six and eight where we have those extra groups um, that are probably not as straightforward to remember as the others the others will be pretty straightforward to remember so here we've got these two groups um, and we're told that they are isometric groups with the identities eg so that would be the identity of g and eh the identity of h and let f be this mapping that takes the elements of g to the elements of h and we want to prove that if we map the identity of g it becomes the identity of h so since we've been told that these groups are isometric we will start with the definition um, for our isomorphism which is this and we'll, we'll use this in our working so uh, the mapping of the operation of a and b is equal to the mapping of a and the operation with the mapping of b so if we write that down since f a star b equals f of a circle f of b okay so that's uh, by the definition of isomorphism what we're going to do is we're going to let a equal e of g and b equal e of g okay so we're starting with this left hand side here so what that will give us is f of e of g the identity star e g equals f of e g circle f of e g okay so all i've done is taken the rule and replaced a and b with the identity of g now we know that when we um, uh, do an operation with the identity with itself it just gives you the identity so we can write here since uh, eg still the right letter 
e g star e g equals e g we'll have f of e g equals this so we've only just changed the left hand side now since in the start of the question we said that f represents a mapping that maps an element in g to an element in h uh, this here this is an element in h isn't it because it's taking this element here the identity and mapping it to uh, an element in h so i'll just write down that um, f of e g is an element in it's an element in h okay now we need to prove it's the identity but we can't assume it's the identity so this is basically an element in h now if you combine an element in h with the identity well that's going to leave it unchanged isn't it yeah that's what the identity does so the next line basically says i'm taking this element which is basically an element in h and combining it with the identity of h that will leave this unchanged okay well then leaves the right hand side unchanged so taking an element in h uh, combining it with the identity of h that's not going to change what that element does now since both g and h are groups it means that every element has an inverse and this has an inverse okay and we can just write down here that the inverse of f g uh, e g okay so this is an element in h is uh, well it's going to have an inverse because it's a group so we want the inverse of this element that is in h so basically what i can do is stick it all in brackets and put a negative one and what i'm going to do is i'm now going to combine um, this uh, equation here with the inverse of this element on the left hand side so if i do that so i'll have the inverse of this element in uh, H combined with this other element in H and then EH so you can see all I've done is just add this here I'm going to do the same on the other side it's like keeping an equation balanced so the inverse of this element in H, which we're trying to show is actually the um, identity of H. So again, just come putting this on this side, the rest remains the same. So F, E, G, and then F, E, G again. Now, what happens when you combine an uh, uh, an element with its inverse they sort of cancel out don't they so what will happen is that um, these will cancel out here these will cancel out here taking an element and applying it with its inverse leaves you with the identity basically it's like cancelling out so all we're left with then is e h equals f eg as required okay so we've proved that when we take the identity of our group g and map it to group h it's also the identity of group h okay so here we've got the Cayley tables for two isomorphic groups g and h so we're told that they're isomorphic so G is isomorphic to H. Um, first of all, what we want to do is state the identity for each group. 
So if we start with G, we want to find the row and column that's unchanged. So that's unchanged to the heading and this is unchanged to the heading. So the identity of G is the element B. And if I look at the second table, so again, I'm looking for the row and columns that's unchanged, 1357, 1357. So there we go. I can see that one is the identity for H. Okay, so we'll just write that down. The identity of H is one. Part B, what it's asking for is to describe an isomorphism from G onto H. So there may be more than one correct answer for this. So first of all, we can do the identity. So basically there's gonna be a mapping that takes the identity of G to the identity of H, that's easy enough. Now, if we try to compare the Cayley tables to find the uh, mappings, that's gonna be quite tricky. What we're gonna do is compare the order of the elements. Now, if I have a look at this first table, can you see every time I um, combine an element with itself, A and A, B and B, C and C, D and D, I get the identity. So in group G, all of the elements are self-inverse. All elements are self-inverse. Now, when you have a group like that, basically what you've got is um, you've got a non-cyclic group. Yeah, it can't be cyclic if um, all of the elements have order two. We haven't got a generator for the group. And every element, every element has order two, because it's self-inverse, except the identity. This is an example of the Klein 4 or K4 group which also can represent the symmetry group of a rectangle. Now let's have a look at this second table, group H. Um, now I can see the same thing, three combined with three, five combined with five, seven combined with seven gives me one. So the same rules apply here. All of the elements are self inverse. So to find the mappings, we want to um, put together the elements that have the same order. So if I go to element A in the first group, I can combine that with the three, the five or the seven. So I'll put three, I'll put in brackets, or five or seven. Then for element C in the first group, that can be combined with five or one, not one, sorry, or three or seven or three or seven. So you could have, you know, any combinations of these. And the last element D, that can map to seven or um, three or five. So A can go with three, C with five, D with seven, or A could go with five, C with uh, three, D with seven. Any combination because of the order of the elements, because all of the elements, this K4 group, are self inverse. So this is an isomorphism. So 357 or 375 or 537 or 5 
seven, three. All of those would be uh, fine and would be correct. So what we've got here are G and H, which are cyclic groups that have the same order. And we need to prove that group G is isometric to H. So we've got two groups. They're both cyclic. They've both got the same order. And we want to prove that they're isometric. OK, so let's write down here G and H are cyclic. Now, if a group is cyclic, it means it contains a generator. OK, so G and H have generators. And also G and H have the same order. G and H have the same order. OK, so the first thing I'm going to write down is that uh, since G and H are cyclic, um, then every element of G and H can be uh, written in the form written in the form um, g to a power k h to the power k respectively so one for g one for h where um, k is a positive integer is a positive integer and we'll call the generator of these cyclic groups a generator of g all right like this and the generator of h like this so this proof is going to contain um, a few steps so the first step is that we need to define a mapping, define a mapping. The second step is that we need to show that um, this mapping uh, maps all the elements in G to H. So this mapping maps um, all the elements in G to H. We need to show that this mapping is one to one. This mapping is one to one. And we need to show that this mapping preserves the structure of G. So mapping preserves structure. Um, of the um, or preserves the structure preserves the structure when the elements of G are mapped to H so these are going to be our steps in this proof so the first step is defining our mapping okay so let F be a mapping uh, such that it basically is a mapping that maps the group G to the group H so that F of G to a power equals H to a power for all uh, k values as an integer. Now, basically what this means is that the order of an element in G will map to an element in H with the same order. So basically that's what it means. The order of an element in G 
will become an element in H with the same order. So we've defined our mapping. So we've done step one. Okay, step number two is um, show that this maps all the elements in G to H. And this sort of relies on the fact that these are cyclic groups and we've got a generator. So since the generator of G generates all the elements of G and the generator H generates all the elements of H. The mapping of the generator, so the mapping of F on this generator um, will map all the elements of G, which we can write like this. Each element is going to be of this form, G to a power K, where K is an, an integer. So we'll map all the elements of G to all the elements of H. And we can write the elements of H in the same way. So we've done uh, that step. So the next step now is to show that this mapping is a one to one mapping. Now, since our, our groups are cyclic, it means that they are finite. They have a final order. And let's call this order N. Then it follows then that if we have uh, an element in H with a particular order, that will equal um, like uh, another element in um, group H when their sort of powers give you the same element. OK, and that will be um, in mod N, OK, which is the order of the group, the number of um, uh, elements in that group. So, for example, if we had a group of order five, then elements which have, let's say, power one uh, and power six would be equivalent um, or power 11 or power 16 will be equivalent. So this is basically what it means that we're going to keep going through the group. Uh, generating all the different elements until we basically end up generating the same element that we started with and cycle through the generating of the elements uh, again. So then it follows that um, if we've got an element in group G with the same order, that will equal um, a different element in group G. Uh, with a, a different power, um, again, for the same reason that A will be equivalent to B uh, when we've got this mod N. Now, because of what we set up here, when we define this mapping, I can write H of A as F of G A. So F of G A and or to the power a and I can write h b h to the power b as f to uh, f of g to the power b so it then follows that g of a is equal to g of b because of the line of working that we've done above here so we've uh, shown that this mapping is one to one. So the last step of this proof is going to show that this mapping preserves the structure of G when mapped onto H.
So I will clear off the screen here at the top so that we can just complete that last step. Now, preserving structure is about proving that this statement is true. And this is the definition of an isomorphism. So can we prove that this statement is true? That shows that the mapping preserves structure. So first we're going to say that let this asterisk here be the binary operation on G on G. So if we took two elements of G and did a binary operation on them and then do the mapping on that, what does that give us? Well, um, that's the same as adding the powers. Yeah, when we do this binary operation, this is um, equal to, uh, because of our definition up here, so this is equal to h to the power of a plus b. So h to the power of a plus b. That is equal to um, h to the power a combined with h to the power b. So we should say up here that um, this little circle here is going to represent the operation on group H. So maybe make that a little bit clearer up here. So G is going to be that binary operation. H is going to be this binary operation. So just needed to pull that in for our proof here. And again, because of what we've written up here, I can write H of A or h to the power a as um, g or f of g to the power a uh, and a binary operation with f of g to the power b. Now what we're really interested in is what we started with and what we finished with. So we started with this, okay, and we finished with this. So this is the statement that we had down here, basically using just like slightly different uh, symbols, G of A and G of B rather than A and B. So that proves that this um, mapping preserves structure. Okay, so, uh, so structure is preserved. Okay, so we've done our last step. So what have we proved? We've proved actually um, that G is isomorphic to H or the mapping that we've defined. F um, makes G um, isomorphic, isomorphic to H. So we can finish it off and say so uh, F is an isomorphism isomorphism um, that maps G to H. Right, so we've got this group G that contains these elements, these four matrices under the operation of matrix multiplication. So we're probably going to be multiplying matrices at some point. Okay, so this is the group G. And then we've also got this set H, which forms a group under multiplication modulo 16. Okay, with these elements here. That's H. And part of the question says, show that H contains a subgroup that is isomorphic to G. So what that means is basically we need to find four elements in H, because it's got to be the same order, where those four elements have the same order as these elements here. So let's start by working out what the order of each of the elements 
in GE. So remember, this is uh, matrix multiplication. Now, the first element there, well, that's the identity matrix. You should recognize that. So that means it's got order one. So we don't need to work that out. OK, let's go on to the next matrix, zero, negative one, negative one, zero. Let's multiply it by itself. We're doing this to find its order. Right, so let's multiply this out. So we'll have zero times that um, plus negative one times by negative one. So that'll be one. That'll be the first one there. And then um, zero times by negative one, negative one times by zero. So it's going to give us zero here. Moving down to the bottom row, uh, we're going to get zero and then one. So that gives us the identity. OK, so as soon as we get to the identity, get the order. So since we've had to do um, that matrix squared, its order is two. Let's move on to the next matrix. So zero, one, one, zero. Let's combine it with itself and see what happens. So that will give us um, one there. Moving on to the second column. So zero times by one, one times by zero, zero. I think I know where this is going. Zero and then one. OK, so this also has order two. OK, maybe it might be worth writing these down. So that's order one, order two. This one is order two. Right, let's see what the last one is. So that's negative one, zero, zero, negative one. We'll combine that with itself and see what we get. So we will get one again. And then in the second column, ne one times negative one times by zero, zero times by negative one, so zero, zero here, and then one here. So this also has order two. So order two. Now, since what we have here is um, a group where it's non cyclic, its order is four, there's four elements, and every element has order two except the identity. This is the Klein four group. Okay, so Klein four group, which we can just write as K4. So if the group H has a subgroup which is isomorphic. Um, to G, it's go also going to be the Klein 4 group. So what, what we're looking for in H is uh, a group of four of these elements where each of the elements has order two except the identity, and the identity is going to be one of those uh, elements. Now, we could uh, go through every single element and work out its order um, but we're really only interested in the elements that are order four. So first of all, let's start, since it's multiplication, let's start with the identity. So that's going to be the element that's one. OK, because that's the one that has order one. Let's now um, multiply each of the elements with itself and then see whether we um, actually get the identity that will tell us whether it's, whether it's order two. So three squared, so three times three, three squared. So we're just going for all the elements. That's nine. OK, that's not the identity. So three does not have order two. OK, let's move on to five. So five times five. That's five squared, that's 25. Now we need to write that in modulo 16. So that's going to be um, nine, I think. 
Okay, so five does not have order um, to either. Okay, seven, so same type of thing again, let's just write seven squared, 49. So in modulo 16, uh, that's going to be one. Okay, so let's highlight that then. So seven has order two, because seven squared is one under modulo 16. Let's move on to the next one, nine. Nine squared, that's 81. So in modulo 16, uh, five times 16 is 80. So um, this has a remainder of one. So nine has an order of two as well. Next is 11. So 11 squared, that's uh, one, two, one. So I need to know what that is in modulo 16. That's going to be a remainder of nine. So 11 doesn't have order two. Might have about 13 squared. So that's one, six, nine. That also has a remainder of nine. So that doesn't have order two. So all our hopes rest on the 15 really. So 15 is 225. So we want to see what that is in modulo 16. Now 16 times by 14 is 224. So this has a remainder of one. So here we go. We found our three elements that have an order two. So the elements of our subgroup, elements of subgroup are the ones which have the same order which is the identity one um, and seven nine and fifteen which all have uh, order two just like uh, our group g now what we'll do we'll call this uh, group s now, when we've got a subgroup like this, um, to prove that it's a group, all we need to do is to prove that it's closed. Yeah. So whenever we've got a, um, a group and we want to show that a subgroup is a group, we just need to prove that it's closed. And we can see that it's closed because it can only um, or it only contains four elements. So actually, we'll carry on up here. OK, so s is closed so it forms a group forms a group and actually s is isomorphic to the Klein 4 group yeah because it has the same um, order of its elements the identity and free elements which are all self-inverse. Uh, we've just shown that G is a Klein 4 group as well. So that means that S is isomorphic to G, since they are both Klein 4 groups. And last part is question part B. Uh, we want to determine whether H is isomorphic to the symmetry group of a square given reasons for your answer. Now, if it's going to be isomorphic to the symmetry group of a square, it's going to have the same order and the order of the elements is going to be the same as H. So here are some squares here. Let's uh, work out what all the symmetries of a square are. Well, these there's the identity which it basically does nothing. So that's uh, order rotation one. There is a reflection there. So to get back where you start, you need to do that twice. So this is going to be order two. The same with this reflect, reflect back, order two. Diagonal is going to be the same order two and this diagonal reflection order two.
Then we've got the rotation. So we've got a rotation of just uh, 90 degrees. So like a quarter turn. So maybe let's write that in. And these will all be clockwise. So quarter turn clockwise. That will have all the four. Half turn clockwise. Put that arrow in so you know their terms. That will have all the two. And a three quarter turn clockwise will have all the four. Now, this is also known as the D8 group. And the features of the D8 group are that it has no elements of order eight, no elements where the order of uh, eight. And also um, it has exactly two elements of order four, exactly two elements of order four. And I can see them here. So we want to go back to our, our uh, group H and C if just two of the elements have order four now i won't bother with the seven the nine and the 15 or the identity because i know their orders are already so these are order two so it's the three five eleven and thirteen so let's start with three okay so we've done uh three squared already three to the power four is 81 so uh, that means under modulo 16 remained a one. So the order of three is um, four. OK, so that has uh, order four. OK, let's move on to uh, five and see what that order is. Five to the power of four is six to five. Six two five. What's oh, not six five two? Six two five. And under modulo sixteen, I think six two four is a multiple of sixteen. Yes, it is. So that has remained a one. So five also has an order of four. How about eleven? Well, eleven to the power of four is equal to 14,641. So let's see if 16,000, uh, sorry, 14,640 can be divided by 16. Yes, it can. So this under modulo 16 is going to be one. So 11 has also has order four. So it, it can't be isometric, but we're going to do 13 as well anyway. So 13 to the power of 4 is 28,561. Uh, let's see, can 28,560 be divided by 16? Yes, it can. So this will have remained a 1. So all of those numbers have remained a 4. So let's finish off part b up here r um, or is the symmetry group of a square isomorphic to h and the answer is no so no uh, h is not isomorphic to we'll call it d8 this is proper name since D8 has exactly two um, elements of order four, but H has four elements, the four at the bottom, the three, five, 11, and 13 has four elements 
of order four. So just by comparing the order of the elements, we can tell whether uh, two groups are going to be isometric to one another. You should now be able to do exercise 2D on pages 34 to 36. Uh, here's the table of groups up to order eight and their properties and some examples of those groups. Just remember as a quick recap, if I've got two groups, um, let's say my group G, which is this, and I've got my group H, which is this, then if G and H are isomorphic, the following properties hold. So let's say we've got two groups, G and H, with these operations. If G is isomorphic to H, well, then we can map the identity of G to the identity of H. We can map an inverse of an element in G to the inverse of an element in H. The um, power uh, or the order of an element remains the same. So here we've got uh, element A in G, which has an order N which becomes an element in H with the same order. The order of the groups is the same. And this statement here basically means that the structure is preserved with an uh, isomorphism. Uh, subgroups of G and H will um, be isomorphic to each other. And the order of elements um, in groups and subgroups can be compared to decide whether groups or subgroups are isometric. And that's pointing at this table. So we'd use this table to help us decide whether groups are isomorphic or not by looking at their properties here in this last column. And lastly, this table that we've got here is not in the formula book. So we want to find ways to help us remember what's in the table. And I would suggest that the th only things that you need to remember are going to be the things that I'm highlighting here, the Klein 4 group, the S3 and D6 group, the D8 group, which is the symmetries of a square, and these groups here, because everything else in the table is the same type of thing. Um, the addition of integers under the modulus of the order of the group. So really only the things in yellow are the things that we need to focus on memorizing.